Hey guys, I'm your host, Alex. Now, today we are taking a look at Yashika. Do you know what happened to Yashika? Not really, Alex. No? Start with All right, let's do some digging, Josh. It's got to be Yashika. Yashika is your camera. It's got to be Yashika. All right, so let's set the scene. We're winding back to 1945, Nagano, Japan. We're there, we've time traveled. They started as Yashima Seiki. They were a military subcontractor for the World War II. Uh, of course, we then know what happened with Hiroshima. They then soon lost their business there because there was no World War. In 1949, they started and changed their name into Yashika Precision Works Co. And then 1953 came around and you know, they changed their name again into, I'm not gonna remember this, Yashima Kogaku Seiki KK, or otherwise known as Yashima Precision Optical Instruments Co. Ltd. So they finally focused on optics. After being as indecisive as Josh is with his lunch, they finally nailed it down. They knew that they wanted to be with optics. Oh wait, hold on. Just as I say that, they changed their name again, this time to Yashima Kogaku Kogio. And this time it was actually translated to Yashima Optical Industries. Were they ever going to settle? I don't know. They jumped into the industry with a Pigeon Flex, a 6x6 twin lens reflex camera. This was then followed by a Yashima Flex. So there's a lot of flexing going on here. Now watch out, ooh. Now here is the big part, the big daddy, or the big mummy if we want to be PC in here. Okay, the big parent. Where did they get Yashika from? Because they then followed up with a Yashika Flex. They started naming some of their cameras Yashika. It is actually Yashima and camera. They changed the name tons of times and in 1958, they landed on Yashika Co. And shortly after this, they entered the 35 mil market, which is where you could say they found their most success or what they're best known for. They entered this with the Yashika 35. Now, it's not this one which they released a bit later, the Electro 35, just the original 35. They also dropped the Yashica 44, which was, you could say, a carbon copy of the Baby Rolleiflex. And at that time, the release kind of raised a few eyebrows over at Rolly because they basically copied their product. So at this stage, Yashica were relatively established. They're five years into their optics adventure, and then uh, they bought another company. That's right. They bought out Nikka Camera, who had gone bankrupt in June of 1958. Nikka were known for making 35mm cameras, and two of which then made it into the Yashika line after a few modifications. Anyway, so we move on to the 1960s. We're getting to the big, the big heavy days here, all right? Yashika had found some partnerships. They had a few with many other companies, and Polaroid was one of those. They co-manufactured the Polaroid 120 in Japan with Polaroid. It's also interesting to note that at this stage, Yoshiko were worth 600,000 yen, meaning that their company had grown by six times over two years. That is quite astounding and just shows that they probably weren't even at the top of their game, they were just growing and growing. Continuing their flourishing market growth, they released a number of popular cameras in the 60s, of which the Electro 35 was included. They also had a few other ones called the Electro Half and the Pentamatic, meaning the only market they had it entered was medium format. Jack of all trades bar one, you could say. Okay. Anyway, in 1973, Yashika entered a business partnership with the optical company Carl Zeiss. This started with the Contax RTS, a new SLR 35mm camera that debuted at Photokina 1974. It was promoted to be a fancier and more prestige line of cameras and lenses, you know, in the market. A new Yashica and Contax bayonet mount was also released, meaning that if you had both kinds of cameras, you can just interchange the lenses, no problems. So at this stage, Yashica were creating the cheaper models and Contax were creating the prestige, more expensive ones. If you wanted to find a cheap way to get into the market, Yashica was your man or your woman or your person. Contax was that that higher echelon. I guess it was perfect, right? Like, what could have gone wrong? But some changes were to follow. Thanks, Alex. So 1983 would roll around and this signified a huge, massive 
giant change for Yashica. The once huge company was then acquired by Kyoshira. Gojira? Kyoshira? Something Kylo Ren. So much like Yashica's origins, Kyoshira was jumping around a lot in the markets, going boom, 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 we're doing different stuff now. So while the following years would not be very favorable for Yashika and Kyoshira, Kyoshira, they did produce a few gems that we love and we will not be forgotten about too soon. So the company continued in the design directions of Yashika and Contact. But something happened! Minolta released an auto-focus system called the 7000 AF. This happened in 1985 and changed the market forever. This was the first popular autofocus SLR camera. So good on you Minolta, but this signified bad news for Yashica. They were left playing catch up, which is never what you wanted to be doing in the industry that you're in. What Coursera did was they transitioned Yashica's mid-level cameras into the entry-level market, meaning Yes, they were, they were left playing catch up, which is what we'd usually do for our news dumps. So, what a good feeling. So, could you imagine the impact of an autofocus system for the first time? People are going out in the streets, throwing their old manual cameras away. They're going out to the, the shops and they're buying new cameras, new flashy, new stuff, new, new, new! By the end of 1986, Kyoshiro was becoming desperate. They needed to have an autofocus 35mm SLR camera on the market. It just wasn't happening. Until they did. When they did, their efforts fell on deaf ears. They had missed the bus. They had failed to cement a place in the market with all the other good autofocus cameras that were already out. With this new lineup of autofocus cameras, the use of contact lenses was not able to mount onto it. They did do a thing where they offered a 1.6x teleconverter, but this also did not take off. This is pretty interesting and it would be interesting to see if, the his if history repeats itself with Nikon, with their new mirrorless lineup and how their old Nikon lenses don't work with it. So this autofocus lineup continued for 8 years, until 1994, when Kyoshira and Yashika pretty much said, this is not working man, we can't do this anymore. We have to quit this. We give up. So the autofocus series was discontinued as a result of huge losses. If there's one shining light to come out during this time of autofocus Yashica failed cameras, it's the Yashica T series of compact 35mm cameras. The photographic community regards this lineup as one of the best 35mm compact point and shoots ever. So the peak of this Yashica lineup T series was the Yashica T4, sporting a awesome Carl Zeiss lens. Carl Zeiss, they know how to do it. Mm, Mr. Carl. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Although not exactly Yashica, let's definitely not forget about this, Alex. Let's not forget about the Context T2. Absolutely amazing cameras, don't you think, Alex? Yeah. Perhaps made even more amazing by Frank Ocean's use of him in the Met Gala of 2017. As digital started taking a strong hold in the market of photography, Koshira was yet again left to play catch up. They had missed the bus again. They had missed the bus that came after the, the other bus and now they were just stranded in the desert. Nothing all that noticeable was released apart from the Contact 645 AF released in 1999, which was a medium format film camera. By 2005, things had completely dried up as things do when they're left out in the desert. Sierra announced the ending of production with all Yashica, Contax, and Kosira cameras. Wow. Wow. By 2008, Kosira had sold the rights to Yashica to a Hong Kong company, MF Jepson Group. And now, bright days for Yashica. They got some water and now they're coming back. If you want to watch our Digifilm video, all things Digifilm-ish, go up there. Watch that video, it's very good. So here's a little update, we haven't updated you about Digifilm for a while. Unfortunately for the backers of this project, Yashica has been anything but prompt. Yashica has still not shipped their product to any of the backers. So a quick search on Instagram kind of shows that Yashica has sort of jibbed the backers of this project as they've started selling the camera in departmental stores. So that's as far as Yashica is for now. So it seems like there's been a lot of high and high and lows and a lot of ebbing and flowing and it definitely seems like Yashica with the new comeback 
it seems a little half-assed. They're somewhat trying to stay in the market. And again, they're trying to play, play, play catch up. And try, I guess they're, they're trying new things, which is cool. But their execution could be a little better, in my opinion. We're really hoping for Digifilm to pull through, purely for the sake that we don't want Yashica's name tainted. Yashica is full of history and it would suck for it to go down like this and be destroyed by the once loyal fans that it had that backed this project. But what you <laughs> But what you guys can do is destroy that like button, destroy this mic, destroy that subscribe button, and destroy that notification bell because the sub button does nothing. We hope that you've learned something about Yashica and yeah, we'll catch you next time on our next video. You've got to be Yashica when you think of a camera. You've got to be